Well, good morning. Happy New Year to you. I know it's been a few days, but uh, uh, we, we are now into the new year, 2019, and I'm, I'm excited about that. As much as I love Christmas and as, as much as I love the holidays, I kind of enjoy when, when all the, uh, the greenery comes down, all of the decorations go away, and we return to regularly scheduled programming, figuratively speaking. You know, I kind of like that, and so I'm ready to run the race of 2019. And so this is week two in a, in a two-part series within the larger Genesis study that we've been doing. This is week two. If you missed last week, we were talking about the calling that, that God puts on a person's life. And, and we're going to talk about that one more week. I think it's just that uh, significant, and there's enough to be said about this one passage that we're going to read in a few minutes. Uh, so, so if you missed last week, it will be on, uh, available on YouTube uh, soon, but today's, today's uh, message will still make perfect sense as we talk about God's calling in each and every one of our lives. In 2008, uh, specifically the spring of 2008, I began my second full season as a fly fishing guide out on the out on the saltwater bay, out on the Laguna Madre. Um, I had hunted and fished the, the Laguna Madre much uh, as a as a youngster and as an adult, but now I had become a fly fishing guide. After being a, a minister, a, a pastor in the local church for, for quite some time, for, for over a decade, maybe a decade and a half, uh, I decided to chase this, this, this dream that I'd had all of my life, and that was to, to be an outfitter, to make money hunting and fishing and, and leading other uh, novices to, 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 to find success in the outdoors. And I'd always wanted to do that, and so uh, a few years before this, this story that I'm telling you, Lydia and I, we decided to move home and, and give it a go. And so now it's spring of 2008, and it was a busy summer. Um, it was a long, busy summer, and I made a lot of money, and we, I, was, I was on the boat. Uh, there were a few stretches that were like 12 and 13 days with with no break, and that's getting up at 4.30 in the morning and then, and then uh, tucking your clients in and washing the boat and getting up the next morning. And uh, I would often be asked in those, those long stretches, do you ever get tired of fishing? And I would, I would always say this. I would say, you know, I get tired, but I never get tired of fishing. And in general, that's true. In general, that was true that season. And so this was the second full year for me or season for me as a, as, a, as, a, as a fly fishing guide. And every day, every day I would, I would be on the, on the back of the boat working. It's a very active sort of a job uh, being a fly fishing guide. So every day I would be on the back of the boat working hard for the clients. And my days would start with the, with the sunrise every morning, of course, and I would see that that the beauty of God's creation and, 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 and every day would be a, a fun day and a stressful day and, and almost always a successful day as I worked hard for the clients. And every morning and every, every noon and every afternoon, I would, I would stand there on the back of the boat and I would ask God, God, is, is this it for me? Is this what you have for me? Is this my calling in life? I don't believe there was any disobedience in me chasing that dream for a few years. I, I felt as though, though God uh, gave me this space to play for a few years. But after two full seasons of guiding in the spring leading into the summer of 2008, I would ask myself that question every day. Is this... Is this what you have for me, God? And, and over the course of the, the summer into the late summer and, in, and, and then into the fall, it became quite evident to me that my calling, God's calling in my life was, was back to the local church 
as a pastor. As much as I wanted to chase that dream and enjoyed doing so, and, and don't believe there was any, any disobedience in that act over those few years, I was compelled back to the role of a pastor, to vocational ministry, back to the local church. It became very clear to me that was my calling in life. It was as though I, I couldn't do anything else. And so here we are. Here we are uh, about 10 years later. I continue to guide on occasion, but my calling in life is, is to lead you, to lead the church as a pastor. To have a calling in one's life is to be a Christian, is to be a Christ follower. We're not all called to be pastors, Else there would be no one to preach to. We're not all called to be pastors, but we're all called. In fact, to have no calling in one's life is a sad place to be. Some of the saddest people in life that I know are people with success, but no calling. When there's no calling in your life, and, and I, 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 I speak tenderly to you because there are probably some people in this room today who have no sense of God's calling on their lives. To, to have no calling in one's life really means that your life is, 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 is random and is meaningless. That's why we're chasing this, or that's why we're looking at this topic today. Let's jump right in, and we'll look at the passage regarding Abraham. Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, his, his name has not yet been changed because he's not yet obeyed. God's calling. Now we know, because we've read the rest of the story, we know that he will obey God's calling and, and God will change his name and God will change his wife's name. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and from your kindred, from your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you, I will make you a great nation. In other words, Abram, your, your, your family, your children, your offspring, from that, Abram, I will make a nation. And I will bless you. And I will make your name great. So that you will be a blessing. <clears throat> verse, verse 3. I will bless those who bless you, and him who, who dishonors you, I will curse. And then here is the crux of the, the promise that God makes to, Ab makes to Abram or Abraham. He says this, In you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So what was Abraham's calling in life? Abraham's calling in life was this, You will have children, and through those children, through, the, through, through your offspring, Every other human being spread all over the earth for the rest of, the, of history will be blessed through your family, through your offspring. Jews and Gentiles alike, I'll bless the whole world and I'll do it through you and the nation that I will build from your children. That's what he's promising Abraham. That is, that is I believe, uh, the most radical uh, blessing that's ever been spoken in history. Going on with verse 4. We don't know if, we don't know if he's obeyed yet. Um, verse 4 is, is the obedience. So, Abraham, so Abram went as the Lord had told him. And Lot, his, uh, his nephew, his brother's son. And Lot went with him. 
Abraham was 75 years old when he departed when he departed from Haran and Abram took Sarai his wife and Lot his brother's son and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people that they had acquired in Haran and they set out to go to the land of Canaan the word of the Lord for which I give thanks. We're talking about calling today. And I've already said that, that I believe if you are a Christian, God has a calling in your life. Now, I've known people who didn't have a calling in their lives. I hope that's not you. People who didn't have a call, and, and, and they lived, they waited their entire lives for something they wanted, and God never intended to give it to them. Oh, don't live your life that way. Don't live your life wanting for the rest of your life for something that God never intends to give you. Instead, search for and find what is God's calling in my life. That's what we're talking about today. What is, what is a calling? Because that's not a term that maybe you use that often. But for every young man, every young woman, every old man, and every old woman in this room, and all of us in between, God has a calling in your life. Look at this definition of God's calling. Here's what I mean. I mean that God has a plan for my days on this earth. He's got a plan. I'm not just marking time. It's not random. I'm not just waiting it out. Psalm, I believe it's Psalm 90. Psalm 90 says, Teach us, O Lord, to number our days so that, we, so that we might attain wisdom. God has a plan for my days on this earth. That's your calling. Again, Psalm 90 says, Teach us to number our days, O Lord, that we might obtain wisdom. Now, what is that? What does that mean? Teach us to number our days, O Lord. It's a very poetic phrase, right? It's not, it's not a phrase that you would, you would typically use. There are really two, at least two possible meanings of that. Teach us, O Lord, to number our days. One could be a very, uh, a very pessimistic, fatalistic sort of view, sort of like Ecclesiastes, sort of like, like, King Solomon, when he, when he was having a really bad day, and he would say, meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. I get up, and I work, and I go to bed, and I, and, and, and I, I acquire wealth, and one day, I'm just going to die, and my kids, who don't even deserve it, they're going to get it all. Like, that's one way, that's one way of, 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 of interpreting, teach us, O oh Lord, to number our days, meaning like in a very, in a very fatalistic way, you, you think, man, my life is short. Uh, there's a brevity to it. I may live, you know, 70 or 80 or 90 years. Uh, my, my daughter told me to quit saying 70 or 80 years because like, like some of us, that's intimidating, right? So 90 or 100 years, all right, whatever. Uh, so, so, so there's a fatalistic way of looking at this that would be like, teach us to number our days, meaning like, like, it's just, it's just, it's, it's, br- it's brief, I'm going to die soon, and then I'll start living. Like, like that's when life's really going to get good, is, is in heaven. But, but here, I'm just marking my days. But I don't think that's what the psalmist meant at all. I think what the psalmist means when he says, teach us to number our days, O Lord. He's, speak- he's speaking in these terms. God, like, show me the plan. May every one of my days count. I don't want to just mark time. I want to live for what really matters. I think it'd be like this. If, if you are planning a trip to New York City, I want to go to New York City one day. You're planning a trip to New York City, and you, would, and you were to say, uh, teach me, O oh Lord, to number my dollars. Like, I don't want to waste a single cent I don't want to plan a trip that, that where, where, I, where I don't invest my money well and I end up not, not, not being able to do the things that I really want to do because I squandered my money. No, I want to make every dollar count. Teach me to number my dollars. 
And in the same way, I believe that we as Christians are called to number our days in such a way that our lives count. That we, that we, we chase after God's calling in our lives. So what does the Bible say about our calling in life? How does a Christian discern what God's calling in his life is? Here's some, um, some, some big ideas. Big ideas about God's calling in my life. Uh, they, they come out of Abram's story. They also come out of the New Testament. Number one, the calling of, life in, the, the calling of God in my life is absolutely necessary. I, I've, I've, I've already begun to say that, 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 that to not have a calling in one's life means that one is not a Christ follower because it is inevitable. It's absolute. If you're a Christ follower, follower, there's a calling in your life. Don't sleep till you get it. Don't rest until it is yours. Search for it at all costs. There's a calling in everyone, in every Christian's life. If there is no calling, then you are not a Christ follower follower. If there's no calling, then you're wandering. Your uh, spiritual term we use often in the church, you're lost. You have no direction. Some of the wealthiest people I have ever known have no direction in life. Some of the wealth, and, and I, whenever, whenever I have uh, fly fishermen fly down from other parts of the country and they climb on the boat, some of them are so, so wealthy. And here's what their story is like. They have built for themselves a fortune, but they have built no legacy. And I see it in their lives. They're trying to fill these holes and these gaps with toys and play and retreat, and and fun, but they're lost. They've accomplished a lot of stuff, but they're lost. There is no direction. Here's my point. We, every one of us, we are spiritually dead, lost, before the calling of God captures and captivates our lives. Ephesians 2 says this, but God is so rich in mercy. And he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace that we have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples. You're an example. An example of what? You're an example of of the incredible wealth of God's grace and His kindness toward us as shown in all He has done for us who, who are united with Christ. God saved you by grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So n- no, none of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. That's what the Bible says about you. If you're a Christ follower, if you are saved, you're no longer lost, but now you're saved. The Bible says that you are God's masterpiece. The last sentence In verse 10, he has created us anew in Christ so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Amen. Some translations of this passage says that he has created you for good works. This, pa- this, this translation says, so that you can do good, the good things he planned for us long ago. What is that talking about? It's talking about God's calling in your life. He has saved you, converted you, and now you live for a different agenda, if in fact you're a Christian. 
If you don't live for a new agenda, you're not a Christian. There is no calling in your life. You are still what the Bible calls lost. But when you've been found, when you've been saved, then you've been called to a new agenda. As I said last week, maybe not a new adventure, but rather a new agenda. This is the one calling you must get right. It's the first, it's the effective calling of God drawing you, drawing you to Jesus Christ. Calling you out of darkness and into light. First Peter describes it in that way. First Peter 2 says, but you are a chosen race. You, you are a, a royal priesthood. It's talking about the church. Jews and, and Gentiles and, and, and blacks and whites and brown and all of the different beautiful colors that make up the tapestry of the New Testament church. He says, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him, what does it say, who called you out of darkness and called you into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you're God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received God's mercy. Before you decide who to marry or where to go to school or where to live, you must settle this matter. God's most important calling in your life is out of darkness out of lostness, into light. If you're still living in the ghetto of unbelief, January 2019, I, I compel you, believe in Jesus. Come, come to Jesus. God's drawing you. God has you here on purpose. There's nothing random. Take, take joy in the fact that he's calling you. Rest in the fact that, that he loves you to the degree that he is calling you out of darkness, that he is, he is calling you into light. There's a second big idea regarding God's calling in one's life, and that is the call of God in my life is bulletproof. Now, Maybe that's not a word you use. I use it all the time. Maybe not a word you use. But, but by, by bulletproof, what I mean is this. We are designed to resist opposition. Bulletproof, figuratively speaking. Uh, we are designed to resist opposition. When difficulties come at us, because we are God's children, because we are his marvelous, his master. His master works because, <clears throat> because he has called us and we are living um, on purpose. Therefore, our lives are, are bulletproof. Like, nobody can screw that up. God's calling in your life. No one can rob you of that. Now, the question that you should ask is, okay, but what makes us bulletproof? Like, why would you say that, that Christians are bulletproof? And the reason I would give is because this is all in God's hands. We're not talking about the, the, the wonderful design that you have for your own life. We're talking about God's marvelous, beautiful design plan for your, for your life, which he planned, as the scriptures say, long ago. Like nobody can mess that up. Nobody, nobody can thwart God's plans. Nobody can screw that up because it's God's plan. He determined it long ago. Have you ever thought what it might be to be what it might be like to be a member of the royal family, you know, in the UK and in, in Great Britain? Have you ever thought about that? Don't don't answer it loud, but but we probably all have, right? Like, man, what what would it be like to like I this is how I see it. It's probably not reality, but like like to have nothing to worry about, you know, like the kind of things that we worry about, like everybody everything's taken care of. Um 
I, this is kind of an example or an uh, analogy, I guess, of what I see as being bulletproof. Have you ever thought about what it would be like to be a member of the royal family? Like, like think about this. You can't steal their car because, like, people drive them everywhere they go. Like, like they don't really have a car that you could steal. Like, they've got a chauffeur and a fleet of cars, right? And you can't ever vote them out of office because they were born into that and no one can take that from them. They're not ever going to run out of money. And why are they never going to run out of money? Because they draw from an endless source of wealth. In that sense, they're bulletproof. In that figurative sense, they're bulletproof. Now, if you believe what God says, if you believe Scripture, which is usually the tripping point for us, right? That we, do we really believe it to the point of faith, to the point that we will act on it? But if you believe it, then look what this, we're going to review this passage. First Peter, we already read this. What does it say? It says, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession. You have been born into an endless source of wealth. You're untouchable in that sense. This should make us fearless in following God's lead. It should make us, when we believe that, that God is calling us to some something other than what we're doing, we should be fearless in the sense that I will absolutely follow that. Like, I love this plan. I love the plan that I have for myself. I kind of like what I'm doing here. But God, what you, I, it, it, it has become clear to me that you're calling me to something different. There is a calling in my life. And I will absolutely, in a fearless way, go after that. Because you, oh God, have called me to that. Or maybe it's not that you like really like what you're piddling at right now. Maybe you hate it. But you've been afraid to leave it. Like, it ain't much, but it's mine, you know? But what is God's calling in your life? And, and, and can you be fearless to the degree that you'll follow it? This, this, fearless, this fearlessness in following God's call is what t- has taken uh, the Karras family, Ron and Jim Karras, has taken them to... Um, north, far northern uh, Canada. I bet it's really cold there right now, right? And they're working with indigenous peoples as missionaries. This fearlessness in following God's call is what, is what has taken the Downs family to Ecuador and, and the Holloway family to Peru. But this fearlessness is what leads you to trust God's calling in your life every day. It may not be that glamorous or that extreme, but there's a calling that God has for you. And God is calling you today and tomorrow and the rest of your life to take great risks. And once we realize that we draw from an endless source of wealth, then we can find boldness. To follow that call. 1 Corinthians 1 speaks to a really significant aspect as to why we can be fearless. And that is because before God called us, we weren't much anyway. And I'll just say that about me, but the scriptures actually say that about, about us. That, that one of the reasons that, that we should be fearless in following God's call is because he didn't call most of us out of some high position or a really significant uh, place of esteem. He just about always calls ordinary people to greatness. Greatness in his economy. Greatness using a different metric than the world uses. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says this, Brothers, and, 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 and certainly, this is for sisters too. Brothers, sisters, 
Consider your calling. There's that word again. There's that word again. Paul encourages Christians to think about this. And and I I hope you're awakened a bit this morning as you realize, like, I've never really thought about my calling. Uh, Paul says, consider your calling. Think about it. Evaluate it. And then what does he say? He says, not many, not many are wise from a human perspective. Not many powerful, not many of noble birth. Instead, instead God has chosen what is foolish in this world. And he's, he's not insulting us. He's just saying by comparison, we're not, we're not of noble birth. Uh, we're not, we're not really something on a stick. Uh, but, but instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world, what is viewed as nothing, to bring to nothing what is viewed as something, so that no one can boast in his presence. But it is from God that you are in Christ Jesus, who became God-given wisdom for us, our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption, in order that, as it is written, the one who boasts must boast in the Lord. One thing, makes, one thing that makes us uh, fearless, bold in following God's call is like, we don't have much to lose anyway. It wasn't like we had this, this, this great, uh, we weren't born a noble birth or, or, or born into to some, some, uh, some esteemed position. Um, Paul is saying, what God normally does is God normally calls super ordinary people. And what's kind of scary is Paul says that God does it, esteems ordinary people. I'll say humble people. Paul says that he does, one reason God does it is to, is to bring down the proud, to shame the, the so-called uh, significant people. There's this ethic throughout the Bible. We talk about it much, that God, he lays low the proud, and he esteems the humble. He pushes away the proud. And he draws the humble to himself. And we see that in your calling. Paul says, consider your calling. Think about where you were. Think about what he called you out of. And celebrate what he's done in your life. You were called because of God's great love for you. Not because of your skills to pay the bills. You didn't have them until he called you. It makes you bulletproof. Third, third big idea. The call, of God, the call of God in my life is, is radical. I would never refer to it as safe. Not in that sense of the word safe. The calling of God in my life often requires a complete and total mindset change. It often is not, does not involve merely a few changes to your routine or, or a few changes to your schedule or a few changes to your finances. The call of God in your life is radical in that it calls you to wholesale change. As I've said, a, an entirely new agenda. Do you know that God did not tell Abraham where he would be going. When he said you leave your people. You leave your city. You pick up roots and you move. How do I know that. He didn't tell Abraham where he was going to go. Well in the New Testament in Hebrews. We're told that Hebrews chapter 11 says this. By faith Abraham when he was called. Obeyed. And went out to a place he was going to receive. As an inheritance. He knew he was going somewhere. God was going to. Was, gonna, was going to uh, give him uh, a people, an offspring, make of him a nation. But look, he went out not knowing where he was going. This is a problem for us. Uh, we, we believe often that, well, God's calling me to a new place and a new adventure. 
in a new job. And that's not often the case. It's, it's often not that romantic and it's often way scarier than that. He's just calling you to a new way of living. Like tomorrow you're going to wake up in the same bed and, and maybe go to the same job. Uh, maybe he'll call you out of the city. Maybe he'll call you to a new job. But maybe he's calling you merely to a new wholesale change way of life. Think about that for Abraham. He didn't know where he was going. It wasn't, it wasn't long, uh, it was long uh, after the calling when, he, when it started to make sense, like what God was actually calling him to. It, it, an adventure is when you get to do something exciting that you've always dreamed of doing. That's not necessarily God's calling in your life. Christianity isn't merely a new adventure. It's much more than that. The, uh, the, the next big idea, I think there's a couple more. The next big idea is that the calling of God in my life isn't just for the young. Abraham picked up his roots, pulled up his roots, Uh, moved his tent, took up his journey with his nephew and his wife and his business and his employees and all his belongings at the age of 75. At a time when, you know, we would think that he should be readying himself for retirement and and, 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 and getting his stuff in order and, 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 you know, maybe finally finally buying that membership to the country club so he could play golf four or five times a week. And, but instead, instead, he, he takes everything up, pulls up his tent stakes, and he makes a radical move to nowhere. Like he doesn't even know where he's going. Next big idea is this. The calling of God is gracious. The calling of God in my life is gracious. I can't earn it. I don't really deserve it either. God's calling in my life is something that I don't deserve. I can't earn. I can't engineer or manufacture on my own. It requires... Obedience. It doesn't even necessarily require amazing skills. Maybe you're thinking in terms of your calling. Maybe you're thinking like, I got all these skills and I could really be profitable for the kingdom. I could really, I could really do God a solid, you know. I could really help him out. But the fact is that the, the teaching in the Bible is that God's calling in your life, it's, it's a gracious calling. It's something that you cannot earn. But it does require obedience. Think about this. Think about this. For Abraham to fulfill this calling, what was his calling? Let's let's review. His calling was, Abraham, I will make of your offspring a great nation. And this nation, which of course will outlive you, uh, Abraham, this nation of which you will be a father, this nation will bless every inhabitant of the earth. Every nation will be blessed by this one nation uh, and you will be the father and the nation will be your offspring, okay? We got that. That's, That's God's calling in Abraham's life. Now think about this. For Abraham to fulfill this calling, he had to do one thing that he could not control. What did he have to do? He had to have a kid. He had to have a child. And what do we know at this point in his life? He's barren. His his wife has no children. God says, listen, your offspring are going to bless this earth for ages to come. And, And Abraham says, one problem. I don't even have a child. What's going on here? The calling of God in Abraham's life is gracious. He can't earn it. He can't do anything about it. He's been trying for years, decades. They just can't have any kids. The one calling, the most significant call, Paul says, either you're going to do that, you're just going to keep doing that, and you will 
We will most likely never, never determine what the will of God is for your life. He says, or here's the option that will lead to you discerning God's will. You can be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing, you may discern. You may be able to, 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 to hear God's call and figure out what his will is for your life. See, see, you do, you, 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 you continue to be conformed to the world. And, and I, I think Paul's saying you'll never know what God's will is for your life. You'll, you'll be lost. You'll be a drifter. You'll be directionless. Or you can work on the renewal of your mind. But until you work on that renewal, you will not, you will not stumble upon God's calling in your life. So, so what are we talking about renewing our minds? Um, <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm assuming that, that the renewal of the mind that Paul is talking about comes mainly through God's word and prayer. Mainly through seasons of, of reading, studying, ingesting and digesting God's word, really making it um, a part of who you are, and then seasons of prayer. So, so I think Paul, when he says, be renewed in your mind, be renewed in your mind, I think he's saying, you know, like, take in God's word, spend significant amounts of time in prayer, meditate on it, and, 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 and saturate your heart in it, in God's word. And, and, and through deep seasons of prayer. And then you will hear God's voice. You will discern his will. You will know the calling of God in your life. And that's a, that's a tender issue. I know. I talk to a lot of you about where you're headed and what God has for you. And, and the want that you have in your own heart to hear God's voice. And I know it's tender and it's precious you be about the work of renewing your mind. Let me ask you, for, for 2018, was your life merely stumbling through the dark? I invite you, I, I compel you to, to think on, to meditate on what God has for you in 2019. Has 2018... For you, been just just settling for whatever this world has to offer, just settling for the next best thing. I invite you, I compel you, I encourage you to 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 seek, to to search for, to to prayerfully meditate on what is God calling you to. In 2019. As I do the same. As I do the same. Let's pray.